on how we can actually improve fluid intelligence. Note to my team, some of these slides we may not want in the actual presentation, but we could actually keep them for the appendix to use them during Q&A. Here's the big question. Can you actually improve fluid intelligence by improving working memory? Let's start with a few definitions first. Fluid intelligence is simply the ability to reason and solve new problems independently of previously acquired knowledge. An example, that's simply figuring out things that you've never seen before, being able to solve new kinds of problems. Now working memory is different. Working memory is a limited capacity store for retaining information for a brief period while performing mental operations on that information. So you're trying to remember something and then figure something out with it at the same time. Great example, we've all been to a restaurant where that server can remember everyone's order without a notepad and still remember to tell you, oh yeah, we're out of that. Would you like to choose something else? So they can take in that new information, process it, at the same time. So back to our big question. If you train someone to improve their working memory, could you actually transfer that training to figure out new problems that you haven't seen before? Otherwise, could you work on me working memory, do some training, and make people smarter? So the study that we're going to be looking at has a great title, Improving Fluid Intelligence with Training on Working Memory. Now, why is this actually important? Well, it's critical. Fluid intelligence is critical for a large spectrum of cognitive tasks. It's considered to be one of the most important things to look at in learning. It is also closely related to professional and educational success, especially with those complex and demanding arenas. Now, what's so special about this study? Well, what's so special is that you can improve fluid intelligence by practicing on information. Now this we already know. If you want to study for an exam on physics, just keep studying that information on physics and it will work. So we already know that fluid intelligence can increase with practice. However, there's no evidence yet that training in other areas can transfer over to fluid intelligence. Now this study actually demonstrates that training improvements on working memory does transfer to fluid intelligence. That is solving those new problems you've never seen before. So this is actually huge. Now, we also want to let you know that more is better. The training that you're going to be seeing in this study is dose dependent. So the more time people spent working on their working memory, the higher their fluid intelligence scores were on the tests. Now right now there isn't actually any evidence for improving fluid intelligence. Now there are those smart drugs on the market, no evidence yet that they actually work. Same thing for claims on some computer and video games that they make you smarter. Really no evidence that we've seen yet scientifically that they work. Now the evidence for improving fluid intelligence, right now all we have is practice on that information itself. But transferring to other domains has been shown to be rare as well as poor. So the challenge we have, again, can you train on tasks that share similar features to fluid intelligence but be different enough to avoid the practice effect? Now Halford et al. has an idea. Regarding working memory tasks, their claim is that working memory and intelligence share a common capacity constraint, meaning you can only hold a finite number of items in your working memory and there are a, only a finite number of interrelationships among elements in a reasoning task that you can hold. So there's a capacity issue here. Now, why do those capacity issues exist? They think that it relates to the attentional control processes, or you can only pay attention to so many things at one time. Now, we do assume that there is a common demand for attention during those temporary binding processes happening to form those representations and reasoning tasks. And we think it's just basically a capacity issue that too many resources are trying to go for a finite amount of attention. Now, Carpenter et al., they're proposing that the ability to derive abstract relations and maintaining a vast set of possible goals on working memory accounts for those individual differences in task measuring fluid intelligence, which basically means this is why some people are smarter than others. Now, they also think that there's a shared neural network going on. Working memory and fluid intelligence seem to work both on that lateral, prefrontal, and parietal cortices. So here's the experiment idea. 
Training that relies on binding processes and attentional control may transfer to a reasoning task where performance relies on the same processes. So here's the experiment they did. Four individual experiments which were demanding working memory task. It was a demanding task. The participants would see two series of, sim of stimuli simultaneously presented every three seconds. So at the same time, they're looking at stimuli one and two. Stimuli one was a single letter spoken into headphones. Stimuli two was a visual item on a computer screen that had a spatial location of a square. So this is what they would see in here every three seconds. So you can see the visual cue, the box. So they would be seeing that black square with the cross in it, but the little white box will move around. It has different positions and they have to remember those positions. And then auditorily, they would hear different consonants. So in this example, they would hear the letter C and they would have to remember that the white box is in the bottom right corner. Now, they would be shown different stimuli. So they would, you would see the C with the white box in bottom right, and then you see in the third area that again you get bottom right with the C. If they see a repeat, then they have to record that they saw the repeat, and the investigators would track how many could they go back and remember. So as they got better, they would add in between different stimuli. So they would add different boxes, like the P's, the C's, the T's. And if you got worse, they would shrink them down so that uh, you could actually make the test a little bit easier. So they had several different ones. You can see where they move the, the white square around and they give you different letters to listen to. So the task was basically to manage two stimuli simultaneously. So as you see stimuli, note if it matched in the previous stimuli. So you just have to remember those two things and then remember that you saw it again and then record that. So if you, got, if you are doing well on the test, they would add blocks to reference back to increase the difficulty. But if you kept getting them wrong, they would remove blocks to shorten the memory task and make it easier for you. So blocks are added and removed to keep the task challenging, but not too easy and not too hard. So it was always adapting to the individual. They also gave you a pre-test and a post-test on fluid intelligence to see did the working memory test make a difference. Now why were they doing four experiments? The training sessions, the difference between the four was how many days you trained on the working memory. And some people did eight days, some people 12, some people 17, and some 19. So the question was, is training dose dependent? Is more training better? The answer is yes. So the good news is all four groups improve the working memory. Now you can take a look here at X. Now X means the number of boxes you would go back before you saw a repeat. So this number six means they would show you the stimuli and then they would have five boxes ahead of it that didn't match, but then the sixth one matched. So you had to remember those five in between and remember the box one and box six. So the more you had, the more ends you had, uh, the harder it became. And you take a look at these different graphs here. This is based on the number of training days. And what you can see is that they got smarter over the training session. So from the first training session to the 19th, they were able to remember three boxes back. And now it goes up to almost doubling uh, between the five and the six. Uh, so the interesting thing is everyone got better. But now let's really dig into those results. All the groups, including the control group, improved. Now why the control group? They think it was just practice, that they kept taking the same test over and they just got better at it. So if you take a look at the control group, we have our t-test, our p-test, and our Cohen's d. But let's just do a little bit of a refresher on what those mean. So the t-test is asking, are the means of the two sets of data significantly different from each other? So the control group had 34 people, the experiment had 33. Their t-test was 2.08, experiment 5.53. So yeah, very different. And remember the p-values. Evidence is looking against the null hypothesis. That null hypothesis is something happening here. The smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence that you should reject the null hypothesis. So the control group was actually significant. It's a low number. It's less than 0 0.05. But the experimental group? Less than 0.001. So that's really negating the null hypothesis. 
In Cohen's D, that's comparing the effect size for comparison between two means. So you see the control group is just 0 0.25, but the experimental group, 0 0.65. So that experimental group had a really big difference. So again, let's take a look at that control group and the experimental. The t-test is the means of the two tests of data are actually significantly different. The p-value, something is happening here. We are rejecting the null hypothesis. In Cohen's D, the effect size between the two is big. So there's a lot, there's a lot different things happening in the experimental group versus the control group. Now let's measure how much improvement. So the transfer to fluid intelligence did vary with the training time of 8, 12, 17, or 19 days. So looking at, if you look at the F test, that came out to be 9.25. Uh, your p-value is below 0 0.001, and the n squared p was 0 0.48. So this F test is the analysis of variance, the ANOVA, and that's answering the question, are the means of three or more groups different? So the ANOVA is using that F test to test the equality of the means, how far the data are scattered from the mean. So the 8, the 12, the 17, 19, are those training results really different from each other? The bigger the F, then the bigger the scatter they are from the mean. 9.25 is large, which means these four tests are quite different from each other. And you can take a look here in this graph that the control group over here, their performance score is about a 9.5. But the training group, they're popping up here into 11.5. That's pretty significant. Now, the training time between the groups, this is whether you went on 8 days or 19 days, take a look at the training gain on intelligence. On the 8 day, you went from a 0.5. Uh, if you went for 19 days, you went up to 4.5. So, straight line. And again, this is just another way to take a look at the two pieces of data together. So there was a significant difference based on those training days. And you see that the p-values are below 0.01 on 8 days versus 19, 17, and 12 versus 19 days. So the gain in fluid intelligence did improve as the number of training days increased. Now the difference is based on training, not base intelligence of the participants. So they did actually control for how smart those people were coming in. Now the most improved participants were the ones that had the lower pre-test fluid intelligence score. So the less intelligent people actually got more of a benefit by doing this training. However, the training did improve uh, for all participants regardless of what their baseline fluid intelligence was. No participants experienced any adverse effects. So no one went backwards on this one. Now the transfer effect of fluid intelligence scores does go beyond an increase in working memory capacity alone. Now the next question is, why did fluid intelligence improve so much? Well, really because of the task itself. And when you look at it, a lot of different things were happening at the same time. There was a continual engagement of executive processes with minimal automatic processes, and there were task-specific strategies, like memorizing was also going on. Now also, by increasing and decreasing the number of images to look back, that was engaging the following executive processes. It was inhibiting irrelevant items. You have to remember what to forget, like, ah, oh, that's not important, forget about it. You had to manage two tasks simultaneously, what you're looking at, where's that little white square, and what am I hearing, which letter, does this match? You're having to constantly update those representations in memory, and then you're having to engage binding processes between items. So the similarities between fluid intelligence and working memory, both of them are using attentional control. Now the training may have improved the ability to control attention. This is really important. Constant updating of memory representations were going on. You had to shift your attention when you got a new three second item to look at. And the test also discouraged simple task specific strategies because you kept getting different stuff to look at. Now here's what Carpenter et al think. They think that maintaining a large set of possible goals in working memory accounts for individual differences in task tests. They also believe that maintaining multiple goals in working memory does seem crucial to speeded fluid intelligence tasks. So you could take those, those exams faster. You can then speed performance by holding more goals in mind. And then after working memory training, you can come up with more correct answers in a given time limit if you're taking a fluid intelligence test that has a time limit on it. And they did put a time limit of 10 minutes on the fluid intelligence test here. 
Now the gains are actually going beyond just capacity increases. You're learning how to do multiple task management skills. And then the dual end back task is requiring you to manage two tasks simultaneously. Now there were some limitations to the study. If you keep training, do you keep getting better? Or do you plateau at a certain point? We don't know. They only trained for up to 19 days. But what would happen if you did 25, 35, 50 days? Uh, do you ever plateau? They don't know. They didn't go out that far. And then how long do those training benefits last? A week, a day, a month, a year? They don't know either. They didn't study that. So these are the limitations of the study. But the significant findings were that there is evidence of fluid intelligence enhancement by cognitive training different from the training test itself. This is new. It's landmark results, which why this is a big deal. Fluid intelligence was considered to be largely immutable until now. This study demonstrates there's a potential to improve fluid intelligence through training. The more you train, the more you improve. Huge potential applications in education. Now let's take a look at the materials and methods on how they actually did this. Uh, the participants and procedures were four individual experiments. They started out with 70 healthy participants. Uh, 36 uh, were female. Uh, average age was 25.6 from the University of Bern. 35 did the working memory training in four different settings. And then the match, they were matched to four control groups that had 35 people in them that had no training. And then there was a pre and post test that was done on everyone, regardless of whether they were in the 8, 12, 17, or 19 training session. Uh, you can see the N is how many people were in each of those sessions. The control group did receive the pre and post training at the same time as the experimental group. And the training occurred uh, each day and a post test for the fluid intelligence happened the next day. So the materials they started out with were the dual end back test. That was the black box with the letter you had to listen to. Uh, the squares had eight different locations that were presented sequentially on a computer every three seconds. And then simultaneously, one out of eight consonants was presented through the headphones. If you saw a match, uh, then you would just type on your keyboard, uh, an A for a visual target and an L for an auditory. If you didn't see any matches, you just didn't make any responses. Uh, each test, answer was analyzed as it occurred. So if the participant made less than, three less than three errors per modality, they would add in one more box to make it harder. If they had more than five errors during a modality, then they would decrease it by one to make it easier. So one training session had about 20 blocks and it took about 25 minutes uh, per day to do the training. So the testing for transfer tasks on fluid intelligence uh, that's looking at visual analogy problems. It's a pattern matrix test that was actually developed in the 1930s, and you try to select the missing pattern. It's called the Raven's Advanced Progressive Matrices, uh, RAPM, and this is what it looks like. So this is the exam, and then from here, you have to figure out what's missing. So you have to choose from between one and eight and pop it in there. Uh, this is another way to take a look at that same exam that you get this missing block and you have to go into the response bank and fill in the blank one. Now other experiments were using BOMAT, which is the Boschimer Matrizin test. Uh, it's similar idea, just a different test, different visuals. And some group comments for application. Uh, this is where we have made some interpretations and some recommendations for positive interventions. Uh, populations with ADD and ADHD, they might benefit from this kind of training. Uh, also, universal educational application to all students. This looks like it's good for anybody. And there may be some applications to older populations to prevent cognitive decline. So right now we're going to move into Q&A. And thanks for your time. Bye-bye.